be interested to hear from you. So I'm seeing the first comments come in. Um, we're close to the public doing curbside pickup and digital services and online story time and crafts, uh, book discussion videos, calling patrons to check on them, uh, operating entirely remotely. Uh, Instruct, providing instruction asynchronously and not planning to go back until the university provides PPE and distances, offices, and furniture. So lots of great comments coming in, folks. Thank you. Online chat rooms. Let's see. 100% online at this time, virtual services only. So um, let me check in with Ellie, uh, who is our wonderful host tech for today. Uh, are we ready to go? We're ready. Okay, great. Um, to start off with, I'd like to introduce our discussion leaders. Erin Berman is Division Director of the Learning Group at the Alameda County Public Library, and she's also Chair of the IFC Privacy Subcommittee. Michelle Javot is the Chair of Instruction and the Librarian for Humanities at Tulane University, and she's also co-convener of the Digital Library Federation's Privacy and Ethics in Technology Working Group. And finally, Bill Martin is Director of Data Privacy and Compliance at New York Public Library, and he's also a member and past chair of the IFC Privacy Subcommittee. Bill, I'd like to invite you to get us started. Great. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, can everybody hear me? Good. Um, so I, New York Public, uh, as with, I think, almost every library around the country has been uh, either in shutdown mode or uh, modified operations. <clears throat> we closed uh, New York Public Library uh, branches and uh, our research divisions on March 14th. So we've been in a completely virtual environment since then. Um, a couple of things that have helped us uh, in, in the interim is that we already had a robust uh, ebook lending program, Simply E, which we actually developed at NYPL and other libraries are using that. So the ability to borrow uh, eBooks was already in place. Um, Simply E also offered a platform in which people could apply for a library card. So uh, thanks to that uh, already being in place, as long as you were somewhere situated within New York State, you could use that app to uh, apply for and get an instant library card. We then expanded as a result of COVID our uh, services so that people could have uh, virtual access to, to our online resources, such as research databases and so on. So we kind of, we were in a good place when all of this started. <clears throat> what changed for us, and I'm sure for most of you, is what about those things that people used to do in the physical space of the library, classes, story times, book clubs, um, uh, uh, various uh, career counseling uh, sessions. So that's where we, uh, we found the biggest challenge. And, and so what, what we did at New York Public Library, I think is, is probably a good model for, for other libraries. We're obviously a, a very large institution, 3000 plus employees. We service a population of not just uh, 8 million New York City residents, but the entire state. Um, so we had to find ways to, to uh, bring all of these things that had been formerly uh, physical into a virtual space. Uh, so rather than do it as a scattershot thing, our, our leadership of the library <clears throat> decided to get together and we centralized uh, the programming that, that we were going to do. And we carefully chose each program and what platforms or which 
uh, methods would be best. And I think we've all are familiar with uh, the, the main players in the game, but there's Zoom, there's Google Meet, um, there are platforms like Vimeo and YouTube. All four of those are ones that New York Public Library is using. Um, there are others and we're constantly evaluating the products. But I think the key thing here and, and, and the advice I would give to the people attending this conference is that at your various libraries, um, enlist the help of your leaders, make sure that there's a cross the board agreement on the need for the program and what platform best suits that need. So let me dig into some of the particulars. As we look at various platforms, let's take Vimeo, for instance, which is a YouTube-like uh, uh, platform. We actually have a contract with that company and that's used for either streaming or pre-recorded uh, presentations. If you have a program that only requires passive viewing, uh, it's not interactive, a platform like Vimeo or YouTube is probably the preferred way to go. If you don't need that interactivity, uh, then don't burden yourself with the extra effort that it takes to, to have a program where you're going to have to worry about people recording themselves or, or being on screen. Uh, what functionality do you need from the program? Uh, the raise hand function, for instance, of, of Zoom might be good for a class that you're teaching, but do you need that necessarily all the time? Um, is the group large or small? Certain platforms cater to groups of less than 100 or, or more than 100. And how long is the program going to be? Are you going to record it? So those are factors to consider in terms of which platform uh, you want to choose. Another important Bill, thing. Can I, Bill, can I add a little bit to that too? Sure. sure. Um, so I was actually, you know, I think you make a really good point about choosing the appropriate platform and like taking that moment to stop and think not just about what type of program it is, but also um, how it's gonna be accessible to people. So I think one of the things that we have to keep in mind, especially for public libraries, is that all of our members or users should have the opportunity to access our programs and services anonymously. So when you're selecting a platform, there should be, you know, nobody should have to create a social media profile in order to access your program. You know, we, we just, you know, kind of won that battle with LinkedIn, right, of requiring someone to create a social media profile in order to access a library service. So think about that whenever you're thinking about what types of platforms and what types of access. Do people still have the ability to just call in and just have a phone number show up as opposed to showing their name on something? You know, how can you, how can you adjust things that still allows people just like they would be in person to still participate in something, still have open access to that platform without divulging who they are to, to you. Right, and I think uh, you mentioned, you touched on an important thing. I mean, the platform should should be relevant to, to what it is you're doing. I, I read and uh, I'll mention this article in Consumer Reports that I was written about a week ago, and I think it was a nice roundup of, of the various platforms and their cautionary notes. But at the end of the article, I had to laugh because it said, Sometimes you can just use a conference call. And I thought, you know, that's at the end of the day, let's not get over eager about using the latest and greatest bells and whistles of, of particular technologies. Um, if, if that suits your purpose, why, Michael, be honest? Bill, we were talking about that with, um, with in regards to perhaps like programs that may have vulnerable populations attending them, right? And so you were talking about um, in our previous call about how, um, you know, we, we know that some of these online conferencing softwares have some facial recognition technology that they're doing voice um, recognition. And so, you know, if you're perhaps having an English language or a citizenship class, do you want to expose, um, you know, expose yourself in that, in that manner, right? Um, and, and so I think, you know, and, and Bill, you were also talking about like COPA for existence and how that um, impacts um, under 13 audiences and choosing a platform as well. So I don't know if you want to expand on yeah. some of that. So COPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protect Protection Act, uh, <clears throat> forbids uh, online uh, resources from collecting information online from children under the age of 13. <clears throat> so how do you uh, do story time and other things that, that would engage children? Uh, the simplest answer is to have something that is 
uh, prepackaged or live streaming that does not require registration, right? This is so for us, we're using Vimeo for these programs to avoid, uh, uh, I don't want to say luring, but uh, requiring children to, to register, which would be against the law. The, um, and, and, and we've avoided FaceTime or we've chosen not to use FaceTime. Um, and at your point, Aaron, about, you know, that's a service that requires registration in order to use it. That, that also has been something we've tried to steer away from as much as possible. Yeah, and, and I think uh, whenever you whenever you do get into registration, because we've been we've been talking about that within our system as well. And so instead of having registration go through the third party like Zoom or through um, GoToMeeting, which is what we use at our, our system, we've actually been using our internal registration system that we normally use for in-person programs. And we're utilizing that instead of posting the public link to the session for all of our interactive sessions. So if it's not a passive program, if it's not a YouTube stream or something like that, where people register with us, we send them the link. This is our attempt at kind of reducing the, the Zoom bombing that a lot of people have I've heard of as well, um, but it also allows us control over deleting the records of who has registered for something. So we, you know, I think wherever you can maintain levels of control over your users' data, that is an important thing to look at and do. Right. So a couple of final points uh, in in cases where you do use um, third-party products. Um, you know, full disclaimer on the page where you advertise those products, we, we do that and Ellie can share the, the link with an example of what we do. Um, and um, I'll give you a quick example of something we recently did. It's called The Missing Sounds of New York. It's actually a, an album that New York Public Library created. Um, and um, we've allowed people to either go on Spotify to, to listen to that or from our own webpage. And, you know, here's the struggle that I'm sure anybody who's worked with the marketing department for will see is, which is, well, people naturally come to Facebook. People naturally go to, you know, the, their platform of preference or choice. Um, we don't want to um, miss out on, on capturing those people. So my response to that is, you know, you can, you can use those platforms for marketing, but you can just also easily offer them as an alternative to something, to your point, Aaron, that you control, the library controls. Um, I'll just finish on one final point, which is when you do use platforms like Zoom or Google Meet, um, you know, we're all librarians and we're all in the business of helping our patrons understand the world as it works. And this is a perfect teaching moment so that if a library does happen to use, let's say Zoom, at the beginning of the program, say, here's how to turn off your camera or your microphone. Uh, you should be aware that, you know, if this is being recorded, other, you know, the company that, that owns this product can can see that and, and so on. And, you know, just help people understand the technology. Uh, uh, one, one final story. I was in a branch a couple of years ago and I asked the uh, branch manager, I said, what, what's the most common question you get? And, and I figured she would say something like, you know, where are the magazines or where, where are the latest fiction books? But instead she held up her her iPhone and she said this, people wanna know how to use this thing. And I think, you know, that just exemplifies the, the fact that people are not struggling with the technology, but they are hungry for answers. And um, uh, the three main library systems in New York band together to create some training for people. And I'll let Ellie share that link. And uh, I'll end on that note. And over to you, Aaron. Thanks, Bill. Um, uh, Aaron, um, I just wanted to do a quick uh, reminder that yep. when you talked about registration and keeping the data inside the library, remember when you're creating registration records, you're creating library records that are protected by your state library confidentiality laws. So you can't release those records or share those records without user consent or without a court order in most states. Uh, it does vary from state to state, but, prior, uh, but both from an ethical and legal standpoint, you want to make sure that you protect the uh, confidentiality of those records. And there is one question that perhaps Bill and Aaron, you can talk about, and then Aaron, you can pick up uh, your conversation. And the question is, what platforms would you recommend to have virtual programs for tweens and teens? I know that you addressed this a little bit, Bill, but maybe uh, uh, 
explicit answer on this? Um, well, it, it depends. I mean, if, if you have pre-registration through some other mechanism, then um, you know, I, we do have pre-recorded programs for, for those populations for the most part. Um, but um, you, we've, we've pretty much kept Google Meet and, and Zoom for, for adult audiences. I'll, I'll just say that. Uh, I, uh, let me just, yeah, I'll say that NYPL is still working through the, the, the choices, you know, the best platforms for the best programs. So <clears throat> I don't think we've arrived at a final uh, decision on that. Yeah, and I think we're, you know, I think this is all a learning experience for, for most of us and transitioning over and understanding, you know, especially that under 13 crowd and what's available. You know, we're trying to opt in for um, whatever platform we do use that I that uh, nobody has to create an account for or have to download anything. We've been exploring Twitch as well as some options for doing some live um, programming on there for youth. Um, and trying to find out, you know, where, again, just, just like normal with teens and tweens, you know, where, where are they at already and going to meet them in those locations. Um, so that's, that's definitely a, a tricky one. And we actually have a blog post up on the Choose Privacy um, website, which is a cross post from ALSC, which is, has a really great um, um, set of recommendations um, for, um, for using these online video platforms as well. Um, and so I'm, I'm actually gonna transition us into uh, the next little phase of, of what we were talking about. We wanna ensure we have enough time to have um, Q&A and talk to everyone as well. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about interacting with vendors right now, especially as we have you know, almost all of our services right now are provided through third parties and not directly through um, our through us right now in person. Um, I'm going to stand up on a little bit of a soapbox for a moment here. Um, so I think it is often in the face of an emergency that we are asked to give up our civil liberties. And I think libraries saw this post 9-11 with the creation of the Patriot Act and Section 215, demanding that libraries hand over, you know, user records, and um, we still have no idea how many libraries, you know, were sent a gag order request for library records. We'll, we'll never know that, or maybe we will, but <laughs> probably not. So I think, I think it is in our nature to help. And because of that, it's in our nature to want to respond as quickly as possible in an emergency. And, and I would caution on that, which is, I think our first order of action is to do nothing. It's first to do nothing. And I know that's hard. And it's hard to say, you know, the best way that we can help is by staying at home and all of that. But we should stop and evaluate before we jump into action. You know, we, we have already identified this clear disconnect between our ethics and policies and the technology industry's ethics and policies. Um, you know, we just passed at midwinter a resolution to create this working group to bring vendors and libraries together to, to talk about this disconnect and this misalignment between policy and, and our ethical code. You know, tech standards are, are just not the same. So we recently actually updated our vendor privacy guidelines, and that can be found on the ALA website. We're going to be coming out with a corresponding checklist soon. Um, but those guidelines are really for you to work with your vendors on ensuring that, that you're meeting best practices, they're meeting best practices, and we're all coming together. And you should be looking at those guidelines when you're interacting with any third party, and that's even free ones, or I should say, especially with any time it's a free service. Um, you know, and I know there are lots of libraries out there that are not NYPL, that don't have a technology committee, that don't have, you know, it might just be you out there. And that's okay. And you might not have a ton of money and you might be reliant on free platforms, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do due diligence to look at the privacy policies, dig into them, make some phone calls, do your research before jumping in. So even in, you know, in an online environment, pretty much everything is tracked. I think Allison mentioned earlier about 
um, you know, nothing really being anonymous, no way to really log into these platforms anonymously. And there is, you know, this difference of, of practical anonymity and technology, technological anonymity. And um, we, we have to be aware, though, that everything's being tracked. And you got to really stop and think about like what, what data are you collecting about your users and what data are the vendors collecting? And are they using that facial recognition? Are they using voice recognition? You know, keep in mind that you really, you know, this is a great opportunity and a great practice on data minimization. So what are you collecting? How are you collecting it? What do you actually need for a specific data purpose? What is your retention policy? How are you, you know, deleting records? How is it being secured? Asking yourself these questions, especially if we have staff working from home, have they been trained in confidentiality at home? Are they running these, you know, are they having individual calls with members with their family behind them in the room? Are they able to have a private space to have interaction? Are they storing, are they using their personal devices at home? And if you're using your personal device, are they storing patron information on there? Are you relying on Google to store patron information? None of these things, you know, really stopping to have these in-depth conversations, even if it's just you or you and one other staff person, is stopping first to have these conversations before you actually go into um, running a program online or having a new service available. And so I'm going to, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, moving forward on that, about contacting users directly directly. So not only are we running online platforms and online programming, but I think there's a deep need and a want and a desire to reach out to our users and, and actually call them and check in and see how they're doing. Um, we've, we've heard from several libraries who have expressed interest or who have already been doing this, and, and I would really urge everyone to stop and think before making cold calls to any users about anything other than direct library service. So scanning your ILS and picking out users who are over 70 to give them wellness calls or any protected class, I don't recommend it. Um, you know, putting all of your, pulling all of your users' phone numbers from the ILS and then cold calling them to ask if they completed the census, that's not a library service. And you're, you know, calling them to give health advice or medical advice or reminding them to wash their hands, you know, you need to create a set back, best set of best practices around how you're going to contact your users. You know, everybody has a right to privacy in their library use. You don't know what's on the other end of that phone. And please consider the implications when you're calling. What if you have a user who has an abusive spouse and they don't know that they've been using the library? to get job skills in order to exit that relationship. What happens when you call from the library? And I know that seems like a, a you know, minority case or a rare case, but, but it is serious and people do have a, a right to their privacy within their library use. So proceed cautiously, follow your state and local library laws. You know, if you have a board or legal counsel, I would consult them before reaching out for anything other than direct talking about library service. And so I think um, from there, we're going to actually move into talking a little bit about contact tracing, because this is another thing that libraries can be asked. And, and Michelle has got some great info on that, too. Thank you, Erin. My name is Michelle Jubeau, and I, I just want to thank Deborah and Ellie and also Erin and Bill. I want to touch real briefly on what Erin just said, because I do a lot of uh, teaching and one of the things that's become a truth for me is that I'm always teaching others about what a library is. So when Aaron talks about these phone calls, you're, when you make that phone call, you're teaching other people about what a library is. So uh, be mindful when, you, when you're in your professional role in that way. Briefly, I'd like to speak about what the DLF uh, Privacy and Ethics Working Group is so you can understand where I'm coming from. Basically, this is mostly a lot of academic librarians, although we are really strongly looking to co collaborate with all information workers, including public libraries, ALA, and other civic organizations that consider questions about data. Uh, we were founded um, at a data conference, believe it or not. So 
basically data justice is our focus when it comes to privacy. Um, to use our resources or to join our listserv or to attend um, any of our calls is completely free. You may not, you do not need to be a DLF member library. So please sing that from the hills. Uh, within the uh, blog post that accompanies this webinar, you'll have access to our, um, our website, our wiki, as well as a bunch of documents, one of which includes an advocacy action plan. If you'd like to be a better privacy advocate, this might be helpful for you. Uh, one broad level thing that I'd like to focus on is the fact that privacy is a collective good. We should re reject the false premise that um, it's the collective good versus individual um, liberty um, when it comes to privacy, because that's a false premise. Uh, privacy is a collective good, and um, that's something that our advocacy action plan outlines. Um, in terms of teaching digital uh, privacy best practices, we have um, resources for adults um, within, our, within our links. Uh, I'd also like to highlight the Li Library Freedom Project. They have excellent resources, and they also are accepting applications to their institute through June 1st. So that's libraryfreedom.org. Um, they are awesome. There's also a, an ethics and research use of library patron data glossary and explainer. We may find that people are saying that we should retain library data for XYZ research use. And if you run into that, you may find this explainer helpful because basically this is the intersection between analytics and uh, library use. And this is gonna always, this is gonna continue to be a point of friction for a long time. In the long run, you need to answer that data justice is much more important than so-called big data. And that's the bottom line. So now contact tracing. Um, anytime you're talking about a new uh, technology, particularly in a crisis, the questions to ask are, will this proposal work? Uh, would it excessively intrude on our freedoms? And are there sufficient safeguards against this? So. Um, these are the questions that you can keep in mind, and I'll be using the terminology that was developed by the EFF in their COVID and technology um, commonly used terms glossary. This is something that they're continually updating, so if you want to uh, bookmark it, you can do so. So first of all, what is contact tracing? Contact tracing is a public health practice. Um, it has to do with IDing um, those who've been in contact with infected persons. Um, in order to let people know that they might be in danger, their health might be in danger. This is something that's been going on for a long time. Um, some libraries are already being asked to participate in what's manual contact tracing, meaning a librarian with a clipboard or something else trying to keep track of who enters the library. So um, this might actually be security theater because it actually is gonna to lead to a lot of data fragmentation unless there's some sort of plan for what happens with this data. So questions to ask besides huh are, where is this paper stored? Who has access to it? Is it shredded? Um, that's just sort of my first um, blush answers to this, this issue. Although I think a broader question about like sort of what is the overall plan for this data is really also uh, pertinent. So then you get into contact tracing using uh, technology. Phone apps are mainly what's being discussed. I haven't seen much serious discussion of like ankle bracelets or anything like that. So for the most part, for the next part, we're gonna talk about the options that go along with your phone. So contact tracing using location tracking. This is not likely to work and it, uh, because the data itself is not gonna be granular enough to be able to um, show you who you've been in close enough contact with. Your cell phone tower doesn't say who you've been six feet from. So while people might say that it'll work um, and I don't think anybody's saying that, um, it's also a bad idea for privacy. Um, Contact tracing using proximity tracking. This is what Apple and Google have been doing, using, or are, are proposing using Bluetooth. Uh, it's kind of cool that they've uh, published their UI, their proposed UI um, in Wired Magazine, and you can actually have a look at what they're talking about. 
One of the links that I include, if you have another hour to get really into this, uh, a Princeton computer science professor a couple of weeks ago gave an excellent talk um, talking about what he thinks about all this and how, um, how it might be done to preserve privacy. And the thing that I really loved is he really shows how in a pluralistic society where we have, um, you know, sort of basic civil liberties, the level of adoption of a phone app um, is going to affect the lives that we're able to save. So privacy by design, if you pull it together, means that privacy saves lives. So that can be your new bumper sticker if you like. The other thing he points out though, is that 81% of people don't have, or 81% of people have smartphones and 19% don't. So it's quite likely that um, this won't work as a standalone solution. And a lot of people have questioned whether or not this will work at all. Um, Nassim Taleb, for example, despite whatever you think of him, has made some pretty quality arguments that this is just not a great solution because at some point you start to disregard constant updates saying you've been exposed to C19. That's not helpful. So um, bad ideas, other bad ideas, just to note, um, immunity passports. This idea that if you've had C-19, that you can get a passport so that you'll then be you know, free, to, free to live your life. Um, if C-19 immunity exists, which we don't know to be true, this hasn't actually ever worked before because people make fake ones or you know, there's a whole list of reasons why this isn't a great idea. And Professor Felton basically says we shouldn't do this. Uh, facial recognition will only make this crisis worse. Uh, that's the California ACLU. Uh, there's a law that's being proposed, AB 2261 in California. Uh, there's a link to a description of that and why facial recognition is not a great, um, it's not a good technology to begin with. It should be banned in my opinion, and it's certainly not good for this crisis. So to sum up, I'd like to say that this will not be our last pandemic. And um, without strong and well-funded uh, public health support, um, including possibly humans doing contact tracing, if we can come up with ways of doing that well, um, we libraries will be asked to be involved. And so we should think about this not in terms of a technical, also in terms of a technical um, response, but an education response as well. And that includes privacy education. Um, as citizens, if we make concessions, they need to be time limited. And I think Aaron has some things to say about this as well. So I'll just leave that where it is. Um, and only in cases where they know they'll, they'll be beneficial. We need to identify and reject false choices. Um, a lot of times people think in terms of binaries and say, well, it's either this or that. Um, usually it's not the case. Taiwan has been a leading example of how civic data cooperatives can save lives and promote data justice. This is something that um, the people have come together because this isn't their first pandemic and they've actually been able to actually build a data cooperative that is not um, government run, it's not run by any market forces and that's the ideal for solving problems at this level. So now we'll turn it over to questions. Yeah. Thank you so much, Michelle. I, I just have a few quick things to add on to that before we get into the question part. So um, it, thank you so much for talking about data justice and 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 also bringing up that there is, is very rarely in life a right, wrong, yes, no, black and white situation with, with everything. Pretty much, I think our human brains tend to naturally go there, but it's it's mostly shades of gray. And so there's there's always kind of options in there. And along with the contact tracing that we know libraries have already been asked to do. So we already know there are some libraries asked to be writing down every single person who comes into the library. I would say to um, not do that practice unless you are mandated by your local authorities to do so. And I would say, if you are mandated, I would do it kicking and screaming the whole way. Um, but we also know that libraries are starting to be asked to perform health screenings on users. Um, again, I think this is something that um, should be done kicking and screaming and not just jumping on board with that. I think a lot of it is security theater. 
Um, and as librarians, we need to be extremely well educated as much as we can about what is actually um, useful. Um, but we know that, um, you know, performing health screening, you know, collecting health data from all library users, you know, brings considerable amounts of risks to the library, to its users. You know, libraries are not under HIPAA's covered list of entities. We don't have the proper mechanisms in place. Um, we, to keep the health information secure, we don't have mechanisms to notify people of breaches. We don't have staff that are properly trained in handling health data. Um, you know, if your library though is being forced into doing that, and some of them are, then you really need to talk about, you know, how are you doing this? Are you just taking temperatures at the door? Is that an anonymous thing? Are you collecting that health data on somebody? Why would you be doing that? You know, um, are you putting information directly into the ILS um, about that patron's health information? Please don't do that. <laughs> um, but I mean, you know, one thing that we can, I can already see playing out and that we have to be really cautious of is that this medical screening doesn't target any particular groups either. So if you do have something with like a temperature at, that you're, you're instituting, that it needs to be very, this is an instance of black and white. If you set it at, you know, this is the temperature, then that person can or cannot come in. Um, you know, our in unconscious bias can quickly lead us to thinking that a cough from a user experiencing homelessness is an indicator of COVID, but that cough from the mom with her kids is allergies. And so, you know, health screening should, should really be done only if mandated by local public health. Don't collect information about a individual user and certainly don't write it down in the ILS and connect. Um, this is an opportunity and, and it should be that there are very clear policies and staff training around any of this sort of stuff. And I think that brings just the last little point I'll say is that this is a great opportunity as a lot of libraries have some down, I will say kind of downtime, but play time without users in the buildings is to do privacy audits, to write that privacy policy if you haven't done it yet. And that any policies that, like was, Michelle was saying, any policies that you create around the pandemic should have sunset in place. So if you're creating things, look at like indicators when you can stop doing that based on public health data. So, and with that, I think unless Bill or Michelle has another thing to add right now, um, we can perhaps open it up to Q&A. Sure, certainly, and thank you, Erin. Uh, I just also wanna piggyback on your last set of comments. I mean, it's not just a privacy issue, it's an issue of access and discrimination. Libraries in particular cannot discriminate. And you brought up the uh, example of the homeless person versus the mom with her kids. You simply cannot deny access based on a perception of what somebody's health is. Um, and as you said, it has to be a really objective standard and it has to be applied consistently to everyone uh, and it has to be black and white. So I can't emphasize that enough. But let's start with some of our questions. Um, the first question we have in the Q&A box, uh, can any of the speakers provide insight into concerns regarding patron data on the OPAC like BiblioCommon or BiblioCore? I don't know, uh, are there any concerns, uh, I guess, uh, about the data that is stored on the OPAC? The, the uh, ALA did publish uh, guidelines on OPAC data collection, I think it was a couple of years ago. Um, I, I, I don't think this is specific to the COVID crisis, um, but, um, yeah, I think it also gets in the area of just third party vendors in general and, and how to to deal with them contractually. Uh, we used to, NYPL used to uh, partner with BiblioCommons or have them as a vendor. When we um, canceled that contract, you know, it became an issue. What data did BiblioCommons still have as they left us and, you know, how, how did we get it back? So those are good questions, but, um, I think the, the, the seminal issue here is when you create a contract with a vendor, make sure that that contract 
discusses not only their data collection and storage and who has access, but what happens after the end of that relationship and making sure that that company deletes the information contractually. Okay. Um, let's see, other questions. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, my question is more general. Huh? Uh, what is your opinion about mandating masks and gloves? Um, actually, I think that um, if I could take this briefly, um, because it's really an access issue. Um, and there is a provision that you can mandate reasonable rules for behavior in the library that you can source to um, an actual need. For example, um, probably the most famous case was the gentleman who sued to be able to walk into the library barefoot. And the library actually won that lawsuit because they could show that there was broken glass and uh, blood and feces on the floor of the library from time to time. And it was reasonable to require him to wear his shoes in the library. Masks and gloves would fall under that same rubric. Is there a reason for it? You may be operating under an order. Here in Illinois, you can't enter public buildings any longer without a face covering. And the library would have a reasonable grounds to enforce that. Uh, I think as with anything, you need to talk to your attorneys. Um, remember what the rules are for access and policies when you're talking about this. Um, uh, and look to uh, the guidance provided by your public health authorities. Um, will ALA, OIF, or the Privacy Subcommittee be putting out guidance or an official statement that libraries can reference in their planning and decision making and regarding contact tracing and health screening activities? Erin, did you want to talk about that? So we do actually have a, another blog post that will be posted today around um, con around contact tracing, um, uh, or sorry, around health screening, not around contact tracing. Uh, you know, we haven't discussed um, yet around official statements, but definitely something we can meet about and discuss more. We should be, we'll be meeting with my committee um, here in a couple weeks too. So I think it would be of value. Um, and so something we'll definitely look into. I appreciate you bringing it up because um, I think that is useful to be able to um, point back to that when talking to your local governing uh, authorities as well. So you'll have to you'll have to forgive me. I've um, also been you know in our library administration and trying to to make sure everything like most of you is up and operational. So we're just um, trying to get back into all of this important work here as well and providing all the resources available for everybody. So just getting back to work in the last couple of weeks here with the privacy committee and, and trying to get all the resources we can out to, to you. Okay. Um, let's go to some of the questions that were in the chat box real quick. Um, and I have to access another document for that. Um, Deborah, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer one quick question from the Q and A box real quick. So somebody had just asked about speaking more on the issue of cold calling patrons. We'll also have a blog posted here probably by early next week about best practices around that. So stay tuned on the Choose Privacy website. I think that you know it's okay to call users if it is directly about your library services. I think it's another one of those instances where it's important to think and plan it all out and ensure that it's done um, with thoughtfulness and with policy and procedure in place rather than just picking up the phone and calling. Okay, um, here's a question that came in concerning library privacy laws. And um, uh, it notes the fact that uh, libraries are bound by these laws, but they don't bind the third party vendors that provide our platforms and services. And what you need to be aware of is that those laws do not mandate that the vendors keep that information private. Uh, as Bill's emphasized, you have to use contract to enforce those rights for your users. And even then, the law may not provide a remedy. So you have to be very, very careful and thoughtful when you enter into these third-party vendor agreements to make sure that they understand that the, uh, there is a law that the library has to comply with that there is a right to privacy and confidentiality for the user, and you expect that vendor to adhere to those uh, rules. 
And when there is a data privacy law in effect, like COPA, for example, or if the, law, if the vendor is subject to GDPR or the California Consumer Privacy Act, you can insist that they demonstrate their compliance with those laws before you use them as a vendor. But we always have to be aware that when the data passes into the hands of a third party, it's no longer protected under the data uh, the library confidentiality laws. And it's up to the library to take the steps necessary to protect that data with through their contracts and their relationships with their vendors. So here's here's one uh, codicil to that, Deborah. So uh, I have seen very rare instances where in a library contract with a vendor, <clears throat> the library has required the vendor to observe those library uh, state privacy library laws that they are in accord with that. Just like you see a lot of vendors saying now they're in compliance with GDPR or the California law. Um, it's an ask, it doesn't hurt to ask. And if they say yes, then it binds them by those by those uh, state library laws. But it would be a rare case where you could get that plugged into the contract. Okay, um, another question on cold calling. I think we talked about that and there'll be resources and the blog post coming up in the near future and we'll provide that to everyone at the, at the close of the session. Um, will libraries be effective in keeping up community awareness through our policies and actions? Um, I am reading these cold, I am very sorry. Um, and feel like we didn't get enough uh, about COPA. She, the commenter notes that COPA requires you have positive confirmation that parents and guardians allow those youths to share their information online. Schools get a pass, but not libraries. How do we confirm adults' identities for this purpose? So here would be my suggestion on that. <clears throat> if you know, if you have a confirmed adult card holder, right, and, and with NYPL, you can't get an adult card without actually going into the physical library and getting that card. I realize that's old, old technology now, but if you have a confirmed adult card holder and that person wants to get a card for a minor, that would be the way I, I would handle that. I mean, this is one of the more difficult aspects of moving from a physical space into the into the um, virtual space. I, and I wish I had a quick answer for that, but um, that would be a, a, an off the cuff suggestion. And I would refer back to the um, post we have on the Choose Privacy Every Day. It does have some more detailed information regarding COPA. And so I'll, I'll kind of, ping you back to that. I think it's a, a, a great place to, to kind of dig in a little deeper. There's not a perfect solution to it. That's, yeah. that's um, unfortunately the answer sometimes. And, and the thing to remember about COPA is that it actually applies mostly to commercial entities. Nonprofits and government agencies usually get a pass, but when you start using third-party platforms that do collect data that have a commercial purpose, a for-profit purpose, COPA comes into play. And um, uh, so you really have to be thoughtful when you use third-party apps on your website, plugins on your website, because if you know that they're under 13s are using it, you have to take the steps to comply with COPA. The FTC has great guidance on, um, on how to do that, how to get uh, virt uh, virtual consent and parental consent, but uh, you have to make sure that you do that as a whole. Uh, let me check some of our Deborah, other Deborah, can I Go answer ahead. some of the questions on there real quick? Yeah, um, I just, I saw a couple on here that I wanted to, to touch on um, as I was kind of as I was going through here. So um, one of them I thought was important was, I, I saw a couple of questions around, we can't, we normally do identity verification through an ID whenever someone comes into the library before giving them the access to their PIN and about, um, you know, account information. So if nobody's able to come into, does ALA have guidance or, you know, what, what should be the procedure around that? Michelle, do you have an answer on that one? You are smiling. I don't know. If you... <laughs> uh -huh. No, I wish I did. So Bill, do you know how NYPL is, is handling that right now when people are calling in and asking for account information? Like, are you um, asking for verification of personal information on the account or are you giving, you know, obviously we, um, 
are not able to give out PIN numbers to anybody because we don't see the PIN numbers, but are you allowing people to read PINs? Um, well, we have an Ask NYPL desk. Generally, the verification is with uh, account number uh, in conjunction with uh, a date of birth. Uh, not my favorite piece of data to collect, but it does help, <clears throat> especially when people have the same names and some possibly even live in the same household with the same name. That would be, uh, you know, if you have that information, try to verify it as, as best as possible that way. Without the PIN number, you're right. No passwords. Okay. Um, so, and then I see someone also ask of where's the best place to stay up to date on some of this information. And so, you know, the Choose Privacy website, we're actually on some changes on there, but we regularly, every single week, have um, new privacy news come out. That's a curated news stream. We also are recruiting our first cohort of bloggers, so we'll have um, a regular content coming out. If you're interested in blogging around privacy, we're accepting applications till June. So look onto the website. So that's going to be a great place to get regularly updated content about what's going on and how to um, how to address concerns and best practices and all of that. Yeah. We also had a question uh, about influencing policy when you're not in management. Do you have any yeah. guidance? Matt? Yeah, I do on that. I just wanted to, Michelle, there's actually one question that goes around best practices and where you find this information. And somebody was asking, where do you find it for academic librarians and, and libraries? Is there a good central hub where people can go and find out more information around privacy um, and, and, you know, what to do in the academic world? Those DLF resources that I was talking about in particular, um, we did try and be mindful that uh, public librarians might be using it, but we we're very clear on the fact that we didn't have any public librarians re represented. So we are very used to having ideas that are not being reflected on a campus level and sort of how to help people understand because the number one thing to under to that I've learned maybe is that usually when you're talking to somebody it's not somebody who wants to take away your rights. It's usually somebody who just wants to implement a technology in the smoothest way possible so that it won't break. So helping convince and persuade that person that you actually have a legitimate point of view, uh, there, are, there are lots of processes to go through and ways to sort of get at it. But this idea of a collective good, I think is something that a lot of people don't think of. Uh, and, and we have more information about that in our advocacy document as well as details about how to just use, you know, Google Analytics so that it's a little bit, you know, less awful for your website and links and resources uh, for creating privacy frameworks and more. Yeah, I cannot more highly recommend the DLF information and all of your guys' resources. It's a really fantastic, even um, for public or school libraries, any anybody should dig into the resources that you have available. And, and speaking of the advocacy information that you have, I think um, that touches back on that point, Deborah, around how do you influence if you're not a policymaker. So, um, you know, I, I hope, you know, I'm it, as a person in library administration, I, I always hope that people will reach out to me if they have concerns, but I understand that it's, it's sometimes scary or hard to feel like you have the ability to do that. Um, but I think that being well researched and coming at it from this point of saying like, hey, I have a concern and I have some data and I want to just have a conversation around it is meaningful and, and important and can be powerful. So I think it doesn't always, it never hurts to try. It never hurts to send an email to someone, a library director or anybody and say, hey, can we have a conversation? I learned all this new stuff and I don't know if this discussion or I have a concern about a policy that our library has in place. I don't feel comfortable. I don't, you know, it's, it's, it's up to all of us when we see something happening that we don't feel is in alignment with our ethics or values to bring it up and to push on it and to, to be that advocate. We have to keep on speaking up um, and have to keep on talking about privacy because otherwise it gets slipped. You know, it's, it's, 
we live in a world right now where it's easy to just dive in, collect all the data and trace all the things and monitor everything. But libraries are not Amazon. We're not Google. We're not any, we're not a retail store. We are wholly and individually unique. And we have and are bound by a set of, of ethics that guide us around privacy. And one of the things that is fundamentally so important about libraries is this ability to access information freely and without being traced and monitored. And so we have to keep on bringing it to the forefront and keep on talking about it because it's too easy to just ignore and, and track and trace all of our users' behaviors. Absolutely. Let me, let me just add something to that there and I completely agree. But again, and I think there's power in numbers, right? We, we are unique and, and a lot of us are in small towns and whatever, but look at, look at what happened with LinkedIn and the lynda.com controversy. Libraries as a whole pushed back and said, we don't want LinkedIn to require people to create registrations to use lynda.com videos. And it works. David beat Goliath. You know, LinkedIn is owned by Microsoft, for those who don't know. So we were going up against one of the biggest, most powerful corporations in the world. And libraries won because they work together. Yeah. And I'll just add uh, one of the things, the ways that I've come to think about it is that libraries exist on the borders of market. Um, I was giving a talk with a group that had this completely market focused approach to communication and I was teaching web resources and the internet and none of them had ever really thought about the fact that the resources that they were thinking about had all been developed in the public sector. Um, talking about World Wide Web and talking about the internet and so this idea of thinking about public sector and thinking about the borders of markets is something that sometimes becomes necessary to help people understand why um, you know we don't necessarily think in the same terms and in particular our websites should function differently than Amazon. Absolutely. Yeah, and I and it's I think we're we're approaching time. So I think yeah. that's actually a good note to end <laughs> on is just the power that we all have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we just post we're the last bastion of democracy, the public at least. And yeah. and and that libraries are powerful and that we're even more powerful together. And when we raise our voices together, we can make change and that we have the power to be the people setting direction around privacy, not accepting whatever our vendors or these third parties are telling us, this is just the way it is. You know, I was told by LinkedIn up and down how impossible it was for them to do this, that we were not a revenue stream. It was impossible. It couldn't be done. It's just not impossible. Well, it was apparently possible. So, you know, don't lose sight. Keep on, even if it's in your small system or whatever it is, if you see something, if you see a moment that you feel is right, if you see that your user's privacy is not being protected, stand up and speak up about it. And you can always connect with OIF if you are getting pushback from your administration or from your local government and ask those questions to OIF and they have resources to help you through that as well. Thank you, Erin. Um, I, I, we've run out of time, unfortunately. Um, and uh, what, this, what I'd like to recommend is that you keep those questions and inquiries coming. Um, we are available at OIF. Just simply send an inquiry to OIF at ALA.org. We also have recorded all your questions. I know we couldn't get to all of them and we'll continue to develop resources to answer them. And uh, you may even get a private response via email from our office or from a member of the privacy subcommittee to respond to your inquiries. And as, as I said, this is just the first of several uh, uh, opportunities we're planning to provide uh, information on privacy. We hope that there'll be some that are more targeted on particular platforms or issues. And we look forward to being with you in the future. So uh, thank you again for attending. Thank you, Aaron, Bill, and Michelle. And um, uh, uh, we'll look forward to hearing from everybody and working from everybody in the future. Thanks very much. Thank you all. Do you guys want to do you guys want to talk? <laughs>